Good evening. I'm Mark Guptegrove, the director of the LBJ Presidential Library, and on behalf of Dr. Don Carlton, the executive director of the Briscoe Center for American History, I want to welcome you here tonight as we celebrate our first uh, temporary exhibit in our brand new temporary exhibit space, From News to History, uh, which will feature Diana Walker and was to feature David Hume Kennerly, but uh, David unfortunately couldn't be with us, so we've replaced one Pulitzer Prize winning photographer with another, Lucian Perkins. And um, I'm going to bring Don out in just a moment who will introduce uh, Diana and Lucian as well as our moderator, Neil Spells. I want to uh, mention that the News to History exhibit, if you haven't seen it, will be open after our program tonight, as will the store at the LBJ library. So uh, as you, you and, and they're both on the third floor, so you can visit one and then visit the other. I want to thank all of our friends of the LBJ library, not only for attending, to, not tonight, but uh, for all of the support that you've given our institution. And I want to invite those who aren't friends of the LBJ library to, to become our friends. This is an incredible program, and there's information outside of the auditorium uh, about all that we have to offer. But just to give you a sense of uh, uh, what our upcoming speaker roster looks like, we will have Condoleezza Rice here later this month, our former Secretary of State. We'll have the rising stars of the Democratic Party uh, from our state of Texas, Texas, Joaquin Castro, representative, and his twin brother, Mayor Julian Castro, Mayor of San Antonio. They'll be with us in early uh, April, and then we'll, they'll be followed by director and best-selling author, Sebastian Younger. So please look into joining us. It's an incredible value. It's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, my good friend, Don Carlton. When we were thinking about uh, the first temporary exhibit in our temporary exhibit space, it didn't take us long to figure out that the logical partner for the exhibit would be the Briscoe Center for American History. Uh, that is an incredible institution, and it is wholly complementary to what we do here at the LBJ Library. And Don and his staff have amassed a remarkable collection that includes six million photographs, uh, as well as the largest collection of presidential photography outside of Washington, D.C., much of which you'll see in the exhibit in News to History. Don has uh, published and lectured extensively on the fields of historical research methods and sources, the history of broadcast journalism, and 20th century Texas and U.S. political history. I will tell you that whenever I have a question regarding our great state of Texas, I go to Don Carlton. He's also the executive producer of the award-winning historical documentary, When I Rise, which premiered at the South by Southwest Film Festival back in 2010 and aired on PBS later the same year with a series called Independent Lens. He's also the co-author of 10 books, including 2010's Conversations with Cronkite about his good friend, Walter Cronkite. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming my friend, Don Carl. Thanks, Mark, for that uh, very overly generous uh, introduction. This is uh, it's always great fun to do things here. Uh, Mark, before I get started, I really want to recognize, uh, take this opportunity to recognize Janie Briscoe Marmion, whose father, Governor Dolph Briscoe, was the patron saint of our center. Uh, Janie, I know you're out here somewhere. Did you make it through the traffic? Thank you, Janie. As Mark said, uh, we're uh, here tonight to celebrate the Briscoe Center's exhibit, News to History, Photojournalism and the Presidency. Uh, and that was really made possible by my good friend Mark Updegrove, who invited the Briscoe Center to present the inaugural uh, exhibit in this building uh, in the new uh, temporary gallery that, uh, that you've created there, which is such a beautiful space. So thanks again, Mark, for that. Uh, as we thought about which of our special collections we would highlight in this new exhibit space, 
We realize that uh, really one of the best candidates would be the Briscoe Center's extensive photojournalism collection. Uh, given that the setting for the exhibit is here in the LBJ Library, it really only made sense to use the presidency as a way to organize this exhibit. Uh, more than 20 years ago, the Briscoe Center initiated an ambitious program to collect and preserve the historically valuable archives of important American photojournalists. Our efforts were somewhat revolutionary at the time. While art photography had been actively collected by any number of institutions, there really wasn't that much being done to collect the entire work of individual news photographers or photojournalists. I had long taught in my history research seminars the importance of photographs as historical evidence, which, by the way, is obviously the reason uh, that our exhibit is titled News to History, because when photojournalists are documenting the news, they are also documenting history. So I saw that there was an important opportunity for the Briscoe Center to take the lead in preserving these historically valuable images and making them available for research and teaching. Now, the founding collection for our photojournalism archive was that of David Hume Kennerly's, the Pulitzer Prize-winning former White House photographer for President Gerald Ford. That donation was soon followed by donations from Dirk Halstead, Wally McNamee, and more than 30 other nationally recognized photographers, including two other Pulitzer Prize winners, Eddie Adams and Lucian Perkins. And I'm pleased that our most recent donation to the collection is the personal archive of David Valdez, who was President uh, George Herbert Walker Bush's photographer. Now, Dirk Halstead and David Valdez are with us tonight, and I wish they would stand and be recognized. David and Dirk. There's David. Where's Dirk? Did Dirk show up? Okay. Um, I also want to thank uh, former Texas Lieutenant Governor Bill Hobby, whose financial support uh, made our exhibit possible. I'd also like to acknowledge the gifted Briscoe Center curatorial team that helped put news to history together. And that's Allison Beck, Amy Bowman, Lynn Bell, and Aaron Purdy. And I also want to recognize Austin Art Services for their remarkable work with the exhibit's design. We're deeply grateful to the photographers who've entrusted their collections to us. So please visit the exhibit and see, see their wonderful work. Now, about our special guest tonight. I'm very proud to say that Lucian Perkins is a graduate of the University of Texas at Austin. After his graduation, Lucian worked as a staff photographer for the Washington Post for 27 years, where he won two Pulitzer Prizes. He has covered many major events, including the wars in the former Yugoslavia, the first Gulf War, and the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Lucian's work has been reproduced in newspapers, magazines, and websites throughout the world, and it's been featured in a number of solo and group exhibitions. He has books that include uh, Russia, Chronicles of Change, and Runway Madness. Lucian donated his archive to the Briscoe Center in the year 2008, and I'm very proud to say that his uh, he, his mother lives in Bastrop, Texas, and she's here with us tonight as well. Katine Perkins, where are you? Katine Perkins, please stand. There you are. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. As Time Magazine's White House photographer for 20 years, Diana Walker covered Presidents Ronald Reagan, George Herbert Walker Bush, and Bill Clinton. Diana obtained White House credentials in 1975 while freelancing for the Washington Monthly. In 1979, she became a contract photographer for Time Magazine. Diana's books include Public and Private, 20 Years Photographing the Presidency, and The Bigger Picture, 30 Years of Portraits. In 2012, Time Incorporated honored Diana Walker with the prestigious Harry Luce Lifetime Achievement Award. And she also has won numerous awards from the World Press Photo, the White House News Photographers Association, and the National Press Photographers Association. Diana donated her archive to the Briscoe Center in 1997, 
And I should also add that Diana is a featured speaker at this year's interactive program at South by Southwest, which begins uh, this coming week. Uh, as a result of an amazing photograph that she took of Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State that went absolutely viral on the internet. Uh, our moderator tonight is Neil, is Neil Spells, uh, who is a very well-known media figure in, in this area of the world. He's an accomplished broadcast journalist who earned three communications degrees from UT Austin, so he's a longhorn three times over. After graduation, Neil embarked on a career that earned him some of the nation's highest broadcast journalism awards. And let me tell you something, he definitely knows something about photojournalism in the presidency, because along the way, Neil has either interviewed, photographed, or associated with nine presidents of the United States, from Harry Truman to George W. Bush. Neil has been more than just a friend of the Briscoe Center and the LBJ Library. For the Briscoe Center, he donated more than 300 90-second TV vignettes about America under the titles of An American Moment with Charles Kuralt. And then, after Kuralt's uh, early death, uh, he produced An American Moment with James Earl Jones, and uh, Neil contributed those, donated those uh, tapes to us. President Mrs. Johnson personally selected Neil Spells to chair the opening of this library here that we're in today. To this day, Neil has remained closely involved with the Johnson family and the library. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Neil Spells, Diana Walker, and Lucian Perkins. Don, thank you very much, uh, and Mark, thank you for the use of your hall this evening. I would like to tell you, you people are in for a treat this evening, and this is something that I think you're going to enjoy probably more than uh, uh, any lecturer standing up and talking to you, because you're going to see history here as captured through the lenses of these two people, plus the best photojournalists this nation has ever produced, and we're going to go through and talk about them. Photojournalism, you know, this, this is coming from a broadcast guy, basically. Uh, television can capture something as it happens. A photojournalist is even better because they get a freeze frame, an instant, and they capture news as it occurs, and it's in your memory and in your brain forever. The great photojournalism of our time is here in this hall and in the Briscoe Center and the rest of the collections. So what you're gonna see now is these two photojournalists are gonna go through, they have picked photographs from the exhibit from other photographers. What captured their eye? What did they like about what the others did? And we're, we're gonna talk about them, go back and forth with them. And then as we go through those photographs and discuss each one of them, I selected uh, about four pictures that they took, two each, and we're gonna talk about some of their work uh, in that vein. And as we go through the program, I think you'll see unfolding before your eyes an amazing array of what this country has been all about through the eyes of very special reporters who call themselves photojournalists. Let's take a look now at uh, the first photograph and Diana, this is your photograph, uh, and uh, would you explain what's happening here? I didn't why, take it. No, 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 no. This is your photograph to talk about. My, yes. yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, but how could you, you resist? You weren't even born then. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was. But how could you resist that picture? I mean, there Franklin Roosevelt is driving around in, at Hyde Park with his dog, Fala, in the front seat. It is, a, to me, it absolutely exudes charm and um, tells me something about the president. It mm -hmm. also tells me something about the wonderful photographer, George Thames, who took that picture. And he continued to take uh, award-winning photographs for his entire career. He had a great touch. He was a photographer with the New York Times. He looks as though he's the only photographer there 
at this moment, but probably there were 10 other photographers, yeah, yeah. but George nailed the picture. He, he did, he nailed that one. Lucian, how about talking about this one? Now this one, uh, it's an interesting photojournalist here uh, that took this, and I wonder, did you know him? I, I did not. Russell Lee, though, taught, he was the first, I believe, photographer, pro, photography professor that taught at University of Texas yes. at Austin. But more importantly, he, I shouldn't say more importantly, but he was also one of the photographers for the Farm Security Administration, the FSA, which in the 1930s documented America. During and, the Depression. During the Depression. Yeah. And, and most of, of the photographs that I think we all recognize is from this period. And he, uh, he's, he has an amazing set of photographs. I, I selected this one because as a photographer in Washington for 27 years, we covered a lot of protests. Yeah. And we would always see signs. And a lot of times you became oblivious to signs because you, so, you saw these slogans so many times. Uh, but what I started to realize is that Maybe those photographs aren't that important today, but historically they will be, because 20, 30 years later, people won't necessarily recognize those slogans as well as we did. And, when, and, and I thought about that when I saw this photograph, because uh, when this was taken, uh, which was, I think it was in, 19, um, four, in the 40s, I in think. In the 40s, OK. Um, uh, uh, Jobs for all unemployed, I mean, all unemployed workers. All these signs are things we still see today. And, yeah. and that was, that, that, that really that, struck that, me. That. Uh, that the issues yeah. and, and the slogans are still very relevant today. Uh, but it, it also is a reminder for all the photographers out there that when we go and photograph these protests and, and we, we get bored, photograph the signs. As Don Carlton said, history. History. In this sense, Absolutely. Uh, this next photograph, <laughs> both of you selected this one. <laughs> now, now tell me why, Diana. What, what was your reason for picking this one, and who shot it? I thought it was absolutely irresistible. Eddie Adams took this picture. He was with the AP at the time, and I love it because I think he it came upon her, or she came upon him. It does not look as though she was prepared to be photographed. <laughs> And she just sort of stops and turns it on. And I love the MP walking by kind of like, what is this? <laughs> Don't you think it's charming? Well, it, not only that, but it's funny. We've all seen so many photographs of Marilyn Monroe oh, oh, sure. that it's, it's, you don't respond anymore. And as we walked through the exhibit, we all just kind of looked at this like, it, there was something about it, this quality, and I think because of the rea reaction of the MP and the, uh, the ambiance, yeah. it's different than any other photograph we've, I've ever seen. Of Absolutely, Marilyn Monroe. it's so new. And the other thing is, and, and I'll just, for those that don't know, Eddie Adams, who, and I think he was actually uh, a photographer for the Marines at this point, it's 1953. But he went on 14 years later to take uh, the photograph in Vietnam of the uh, South Vietnamese general executing the Viet Cong suspect that became probably one of the iconic images of the uh, Vietnam War yeah. and may have been one of the photographs that, that helped change the attitude and, of and, the public about that. And that war. photograph is part of the exhibit here and is uh, that you'll be able to see after this program and we'll walk through the exhibit and catch it. It's, there are many, many iconic news pictures that the Briscoe Center has collected that changed our thinking about all kinds of events in the United States over the last 50 years, yeah. 75 years. That's an important observation, and you'll see that as you walk through the exhibit. Uh, this next one, Lucian, is uh, one that, uh, uh, that you took, uh, uh, you picked, that Jimmy Dodd took. And what was it about this photograph that grabbed your attention? Well, it, 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 um, as I was discussing with somebody earlier, it, it's kind of the anti-Norman anti Rockwell painting, mm -hmm. in a way, when you look at it. Uh, but it's very, to me, Rockwell-ish in, in the sense that this is, this is, uh, this is, an, this is from the Korean War. And the other reason yeah. I selected it was that, as a photographer for the Post, I've covered funerals for Iraqi, veterans, Afghan veterans, uh, it, the, the, it just goes down the list. And when I saw Korea, I, I said to myself, 
how many wars have we been going through? You forget. And the, the, the war in Korea had three, I think that the caption said 300,000 Texans served in Korea. Um, but I think also this historically is very important because in this photograph, uh, you see the family, you see the house. Um, it's it's an image, I think, that uh, may not have been interesting as interesting back when it was taken as I think it is today for a lot of historians who have an opportunity to, to see the family, that the way people lived in the 50s, and, and the thought of this casket being inside this small house. I mean, it's, yeah. it's a very, very compelling for a lot of reasons. Again, this photograph, both of you selected this, uh, uh, Flip Schulke, and it's a, a, a desegregation demonstration. These people were demonstrating against desegregation. Well, as I understand, if I remember correctly, I think uh, some African-American black students were walking, to, going, going to school, and these were, were people yelling at them. The <clears throat> Kennedy had um, uh, sent an order to desegregate. Right. And uh, to me, the reason I chose it and um, on my list of wonderful pictures is that you really, you really feel the hate. You understand it. You, you don't understand it but you can comprehend it. You can take it in, and it's all over that picture. It is, and it gives you some idea of this terrible struggle that was going on in the South. And this obviously well, was- and I, I thought the same thing, because I, I felt like the students walking through this gauntlet. Yeah. Um, you could just understand the fear that they would have. And, and you know, I should really point out, too, that uh, Flip Schulke, who took this photograph, of uh, spent most of his time photographing in the South um, and under very sort of wartime conditions. He, he, I met him once and he described how they were followed by pickup trucks with guys and guns and that they would have to change their license plates, change cars. Uh, they would have to sleep in black neighborhoods because they were, they were afraid that they would get lynched. It was a very, very, uh, another quick story is that he photographed for Ebony Magazine, a black magazine, and he said that uh, um, they sent a black photographer and the photographer was immediately arrested because they, they saw him with cameras and they figured he stole them. So it was a very difficult uh, time and what he covered during this period is probably as bad as any war zone that I've been to. That's an interesting comparison, uh, a war zone comparison. Before we talk about this picture, uh, Diana, you selected this. Uh, George Thames was a photographer. Uh, and it's titled, The Loneliest Job. Tell me what moved you about this photograph. Well, my reaction to this photograph, I think, is probably different um, from the next person's because I've done um, quite a lot of behind the scenes photography in the Oval Office with the president. And you don't ask the president to go do something. Uh, the president is there and you will photograph whatever you see him doing. And I can imagine George in this picture. He was apparently sitting in the Oval Office quietly in a corner wait, watching Kennedy, watching what he was doing that day. And Kennedy got up out of his seat and he went to the table behind his chair. And to me, this picture is almost perfect. I can see George quietly getting up, as quiet as he possibly could be, not to disturb the president. Because the president is not aware that George is in the room. You was, don't have the, the feeling that... Was George uh, the White House photographer at the no, time? No, he was with you, the New York Times uh -huh. for his whole career. And he asked to be behind the scenes this particular day. Mm -hmm. And the president is reading the newspaper. And the president shared with, with George later that he was reading a column by Arthur Kroc, um, which was critical of the president. And, he was, and so he was very critical of Mr. Kroc. But it was, um, to, to me, the picture is perfect because you can make it emblematic of it being the loneliest job in the world. And it's backlit, three windows. I mean, 
it happened right in front of him, and it's a beautiful picture. It says a lot just in that one photograph. Lucian, uh, speaking of John F. Kennedy, uh, you selected this picture uh, taken in San Antonio the day before the assassination? Uh, I, I selected that because when I went through the exhibition last week, I was with Frank Johnston, who was a photographer with the Washington Post, and who took this photo. And I looked at it that and go, wow, that's a great photo, Frank. I said, I've never seen it before. And he goes, well, it's, it was never published. Mm. And, uh, and so one of the reasons I picked it is because there are so many great images that never were published. And this, this is, to me, it's, it's, a, it's just a lovely moment. And, uh, um, but it was one that at the time was not published, but it's in this exhibit today. It got lost in all the coverage of the assassination, I assume, well, right after that. Uh, you're absolutely right. Yeah. You know, let's talk about that a minute. Uh, Lucian, you selected this one. Robert Jackson took this photograph, and I think every Texan has this one just ingrained, like people all over the country. Uh, describe this picture, uh, besides its news value, what do you find compelling about it? Well, I, I selected this again because Frank Johnston and I were discussing it, and he was actually there taking photographs as well. Um, but Frank was, uh, Bob Jackson took this photograph. Frank was right next to, next to him, and Jack uh, Ruby stepped in between them and blocked Frank's position uh, from taking the photograph. There was actually three photos photographers there. Um, and so one of the reasons I, I selected this, and I think Diana can attest to this, is that any event that we cover, uh, you don't necessarily, you're not necessarily going to get the photo uh, be it, by the fact that you're there. There's so many other things that can go wrong. It could be that if you're, if, as Diana will tell you, if we're photographing a president and I go on one side of the room and she goes on the other, and the president waves at somebody over there, and you don't have the, the, sh the photo. You have to go back to the newsroom and say, I missed it. I missed it. And, um, but this is a little bit. Well, that never happened to me, Lucian. <laughs> 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 it never happened to me. Yeah. Um, let me, let me, but uh, so, but, and it, it's really interesting, because I knew Frank for years and years, and, and it was only recently that he told this story. And, it, I, and I was thinking, it's got to be very difficult to be in a, in a situation like this, uh, and you know, of course, not get the photograph. But, um, and I should just quickly point out that this, the situation here is something that a lot of photographers are really, we've all done it uh, at one time or the other, where the police have, they've arrested somebody and they want, they want it to be, they want the, the coverage so that the, the public knows that they're doing a good job. So. The Dallas police calls all the, the wire services and they say, we're bringing Oswald, Oswald you know, from booking to you know, wherever else he's gonna go. And so the photographers are there waiting to get this photograph. And of course, who imagines that yeah, the person's gonna get assassinated? You know, interestingly, uh, talk about how memory uh, changes. Uh, George Phoenix, and many of you may know George, he's uh, from Austin here, and he was at this same place, at this same time, shooting television film uh, for KRLD-TV in Dallas. And he shot his footage of it, took it back, and it, it went into the normal coverage. I ran into George uh, maybe five years ago, and he, along with a couple of other Dallas uh, reporters, we're putting together a book about the untold story about what happened in the media in Dallas around the assassination. He said, Neil, I looked at my film for the first time that I shot that day, and he said, damn, it's nothing like I remember it. He said, I've been telling this story over and over, and when I looked at my own film, I've been telling it wrong. Wow. And it just, I think, is a testimony to the fact that why pictures are so important to capture the photograph where this guy was looking through a lens at what happened and for 30 years or whatever he didn't uh, didn't go back and check uh, his own film but over the years the retelling eyewitnesses sometimes are not as good 
as, as they should be. Well, excuse me for interrupting there, but uh, again, let's stay on this topic because Diana, you selected this photograph that uh, oh, just, yes. just moved I, you. I, photo I chose this because um, this is another photograph taken by Eddie Adams. And um, it, where a photographer stands during an event is terribly important. And you have choices to make. Mostly in the White House, they have ropes and, st and stanchions and uh, bleachers and all kinds of things to keep you in one place. Um, but Eddie must have had quite a lot of choice that day at the, up at the um, cemetery. And he must have been using a, quite a long lens. But he was just in the right place to make this incredibly affecting picture of a young, uh, grieving widow, grieving widow and who, her eyes her, just, it, uh, and she was just given the flag. And she is speaking to um, one of the priests, I assume, from the look of it. And that, I find it a very moving picture. And I think it is emblematic of a, just a terrible time for this country. It, it captures it just mm. totally. Uh, Diana, oh. you, you also selected this picture. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> Dirk Halstead, where are you? You took this picture. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't get over this. Um, now, Dirk Halstead, who's in a crowd, who was introduced right down here in the front, he took this photograph, and, and it's upstairs in the exhibit as well. Well, um, Dirk is the reason that I um, gave my archives here to, um, to the Briscoe Center. Um, we were colleagues together at Time Magazine for a long time. I just think it's the most perfect campaign picture. I've never seen it before until this show. This show has so many wonderful surprises in it. But this to me, first of all, Dirk took, um, I know nothing about how he took this picture, so I'm just gonna talk about it. He chose to be behind the candidate. That's the first thing. He got up on the stage, he went behind. A lot of times when you go behind, you miss what's out front. So it's a risk to do it. He did it, and it was absolutely the place to be. You have the faces of other people down in the front, adoring crowd. You have all those signs, all those flags, and then you have the candidate, Richard Nixon, with his sort of emblematic V. His classic pose. His classic pose, and it's sort of, the book, the picture has so much energy, and it says to me, campaign, and it says to me, and I'm gonna win. <laughs> you know, Lucian, you had mentioned earlier about the signs. Notice they have the Nixon sign upside down, and it spells Noxon. <laughs> 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 yes, they do, look at that. Neil, I never saw that till now. That's a really good answer. Well. <laughs> Here come to press. Look at and it. And you remember, here come to judge. Here come yeah. to judge. Well, here come to press. So, this uh, your observation about science, I think, is just uh, a, a truly, truly spot on here. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, everybody has seen this picture uh, called "Terror of War," and Lucian, tell us about well, it. Well, th this was taken in 1972, and one reason I re remember very well before I was a photographer is that uh, my, I was, my draft year was 1972. And uh, my draft number was so low, I thought for sure that I was gonna be drafted. And I remember seeing this photograph among many others and praying that I was not gonna get drafted, which I did not. Um, but the other part of this story is that the photographer, uh, Nick Utt, who, who took this photograph, um, right after this happened, he put the, this, the little girl in his car and drove her to a hospital. Oh, and the she, the, the yeah. photographer of, the, of this photograph. Um, and uh, I think she had 17 operations. She, um, her clothing was burned off her body, was that what happened? Yeah, it was a, a napalm uh, uh, airstrike. I think uh, American planes dropped napalm on the village and, and uh, I think. I yeah. could be wrong about that. Um, but so he took her to the hospital and they've uh, been in touch ever since. And as a matter of fact, they just, the photographer, and I can't think of her name, uh, they just had a reunion uh, uh, last year. Yeah. Okay. Um, so 
that was that's, part. Of it. That's, yeah. that's, that's, that's amazing and an amazing backstory on it as well. Uh, moving ahead, Diana, you selected this picture of the Watergate hearings. Yeah, I suggested it, I mean, I selected it, Neil, because um, I think it's so good, and it's so hard to do. Uh, we've all had to shoot on the hill, in uh, Capitol Hill, and this was during the Watergate hearings. And you usually end up sitting on the floor between the senators on, on one side and the witness on the other, and you can't stand up. Um, during the session. Oh, you see session. that all the time. The yeah. photographer's sitting We're down. We're all sitting down, down. Yeah. yes. And every so often when there's a break, you can stand up. And um, Wally McNamee took this picture. Um, and to me, it's absolutely perfect. It's sort of like when you're listening to a symphony and everything comes together. Because it, I feel the import of, the, of those hearings. I've, I know the the players, I know Howard Baker and Senator Irvin and, and the counsels to those senators. And it, it just, I just think it, it's um, beautifully put together and, and just sort of happened. And he just got it. Yeah. That's amazing. It's, it's very indicative of, of what was happening. Um, and you're right, I've never seen a photograph on the Hill like this ever again. Oh, really? No, it's no. hard. It just, yeah. I mean, it's really amazing. Well, now let's, let's take a break from this sort of coverage. And Lucian, you selected this picture, and uh, Diana took this picture. Okay. Well, uh, this is Steve Jobs at Apple. And, and of course, when I saw it, it I, this is not the Steve Jobs that I, you read about. And part of the reason I, I, I selected it, because I wanted to hear the backstory from, from <laughs> Well, Diana, this is quite an interesting, it's, uh, I think, uh, what's it titled? Didn't you, a cup of tea or something like that? Mm, like I, don't, I don't remember a title. I, I was sent out, um, I covered the White House every other month, and so I had these other months where I could do other kinds of work, and they sent me out to photograph Steve Jobs, and this was in 1982, when he was very, still very young. And um, he said, well, would you like to see my new house? I said, sure. And so we went over to the new house, and he didn't have any furniture in it. So I photographed him in his new house without any furniture, <laughs> and it was just that simple. Um, and it was night, and there was no light except the one Tiffany lampshade. And I teased him about being so successful, but not having no you know, furniture. No furniture. <laughs> and he was very, he enjoyed that. And it began a, a friendship and an association that lasted um, um, his whole life. We were friends. Um, and he, um, Time sent me out to photograph him about every couple of years, oh. over the years, for 20 some years. And I became a great admirer of his. Fascinating. Let me, let me ask you one more question about this photograph. Was this a portrait type shot or was it just something that occurred? No, it was a portrait because he, we had been in the kitchen having a cup of coffee and talking about the schedule for the next day. I was, we were doing a big story on him and I wanted to photograph him in all, his, all aspects of his life. And so I said, well, here you are in the house. Let me take a picture of you. Do you mind coming in? And he said, no, I'll sit down and with my my hi-fi and my book and my cup of tea, I have everything I need. <laughs> so there he was. Uh, Steve Jobs. Uh, uh, emotions show up in so many different ways. Diana took oh. this picture. Well, I get uh, Not took oh, it. You no. took this Lucian picture took this of Lucian. Picture. Yes, this I chose Lucian's it. This is Lucian's picture. Yes, it is. But you selected it. I selected it. And I selected it because Lucian got to do all the fun stuff. I mean, <laughs> he was out there. And what Lucian was doing was he was photographing the mood of America. He was photographing. And this is the inauguration. And this is the inauguration of Obama. And it's the first black president of the United States. And these two ladies had come down from Philadelphia, apparently. And Lucian, tell us about them, because to me, each has the most wonderful expression of pride. And it must have been an extraordinary moment for them on January 20th, 2009. And the sister on the left 
is just almost exhausted with her emotion. And on the right, is that, is there, has there ever been a better expression of pride and joy? And just real pride. Well, it, it was on the mall. I forget now how many people were there. It was a, a million, maybe. Uh, and <clears throat> I'm going through trying to figure out who to photograph. Uh, and there's a lot of people to photograph. Um, and it's one of those things where you, you try to figure out, okay, am, am I going to just go from one to another and just keep photographing people? Or maybe do I just stick with one or two people? And I saw these two women. I said, I'm going to stick with these two women. They, were, they had been there since, I think, 4 a.m. AM in the morning on the mall. It was very cold. Two sisters. Uh, two sisters. They were so excited. Um, I spent... I ended up just staying with them the whole time, and it was a, a, an extraordinary experience. I mean, for the inauguration itself, and it was it was risky because uh, the, the the post is expecting all you know hundreds of photos from me on the mall, and I just said this is. I want to. Good thing you did. I want to stay with page. these two two women. Yeah. Well, uh, did you disappear like George Thames did in the? And in the Oval Office, uh, were they aware that you were? Uh, they were so excited about the moment. Uh, they, I mean, they were aware of me, but I was the last thing on their mind in the sense that they had come to see Obama inaugurated, and uh, and that's what was on their minds, and, which is great because I didn't have to worry about um, them, you know, uh, looking at me or 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 or, you know, or being involved, you know distracted by me. Uh, they, they were fully engaged and just, it, it was wonderful. Great. Well, this photograph was <laughs> taken by David Valdez. David, uh, you were introduced earlier. You here in the audience? Yeah, right back there. David took this picture and, uh, <laughs> and Diana selected it. Yes. And uh, I this... had to select it because um, for years, I <laughs> tried to do uh, behind the scenes pictures. Now, behind the scenes for me ended up being the president taking off his jacket and rolling up his sleeves <laughs> to write a speech. You know, that was, that was behind the scenes. And this truly is a behind the scenes picture taken in, in uh, when the, the uh, then w Vice President Bush was in Kenny Bunkport with his family. And I don't know whether it was David's idea um, first of all, it was wonderful that David was there and that the family felt so easy with him that he could photograph this wonderful, crazy morning scene. But um, beyond that, it was, a, it was a good picture to put out there because obviously it's not an open photo op and it was um, totally behind the scenes and it was one of those pictures that told you, told you about the character of the vice president, and he was running that year, uh, or ran this, the oh, next this year. This is while he was vice president. This is while he was uh, vice president, yes. And um, there was, was no makeup person present. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's um, it's a lot of fun. There's another photograph in this show, which was also taken by a um, a man who's given his archives to Briscoe, um, Eric Draper. Mm -hmm. um, and he was the uh, ph photographer to George W. Bush. And indeed, um, don't miss this picture because it's interesting. He took the picture of uh, when George W. Bush was hearing about the attack on 9-11. And he was in a school, uh, in a classroom. And Eric Draper's picture is in this show. And the White House photographer is the the personal photographers to the president do a fantastic job because they not only chronicle every single thing that the president does um, and everybody who sees him, um, but they also uh, are able on occasion to take pictures that uh, never, never would have been seen had they not been there and trusted entirely by the president. That's, uh Let's deviate for a moment, uh, because you bring up a very good point here, and that is the White House photographer who has access all the time. He's there, and uh, no one 
I mean, the president probably becomes oblivious just because uh, they're omnipresent. But let's talk about the current time right now. Uh, and uh, I want to get your viewpoints, both of you, in this regard. Uh, there's been, uh, I guess, presidents since I can remember back in the uh, LBJ days, as an example, have always tried to manage the press. Oh, yes. Have <laughs> always tried to make sure that the press does it the way they want it, and, and they seldom succeed in that regard. Uh, but lately, and I think the Washington Post has been out front in criticism that uh, the current president has been managing uh, the media uh, better, if you can use that phrase, than any president before that. And that many publications, such as the Post or maybe Time, take handouts from the president uh, White House photographer because they are not allowed access. And I think this was a, a, kerf a kerfuffle about, hey, we didn't get to see the president playing golf with Tiger Woods, so they took a White House photo. What, what's your reaction to that? Well, White House um, handing out of White House photographs has never been the press's favorite thing um, because we want to be there. And we want our photographer to be there. And um, it, we think that the, 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 the photographer of the president has a certain bias. He's on the team. And we want a, a more impartial, or we think we do, um, view. Um, so although we've had to run pictures like that over the years, um, Many of you probably aren't old enough to remember when Ronald Reagan was um, shot. He was in the hospital. Well, it was very reassuring to see that picture of him uh, in the hospital. It, these are pictures that can't be taken by a whole press pool. And so to take that and run it is important and necessary. It is, it's just not always what the press wants to do, because they, you know, want their own person. Listen your observation. Well, it's, it's funny, and, and Diane probably can speak to this better, better than me on some levels, is that what I've noticed is that with each administration, and, and it doesn't matter if they're Democratic or Republican right. administrations, but each one learns from the other how to better manage the press, so to speak, and how to uh, uh, sort of get their message out and bypass the press. And, they, and each one is a little bit more successful. And when I look at Washington, I first came to Washington in 1979 under Carter and then Reagan, and look at, at it today and the control that the White House has, it's a, it's a successive uh, step. Each, each administration, they, they seem to manage to curtail the press a little bit more each, each time. But don't you think and also, Lucian, now that the press doesn't have uh, the presence or the strength at the White the House? Or the power. The or the power that the, we the used to have. The press right now, I, I think a, a lot of it is, is that the press is on the run in many ways. We're, you know, the Post, the other newspapers financially cannot afford to do what they once did. Um, they can't. They can't really afford to, for for the White House. I mean, for the the Washington Post to send a photographer with the president to uh, to Chicago, uh, costs tens of thousands of dollars. Um, and do you want to invest that money in doing that? Uh, or rely on a pool photographer, or right. the AP, uh, or someone so. One like is cost, but also uh, the, the the press has become so splintered. And, and the White House has become very good at, okay, if you don't want the information, we'll give it to somebody else. Or we'll give the photo to somebody else, we won't give it to you. So there's a lot of manipulation uh, with the press, and the press just th is not, does not have the power that they it They don't have had. the power or the clout anymore. So yeah. when, when the White House decided that they were not gonna allow a pool to see the president on this golfing outing, the press kind of went, oh, that's bad. Yeah. But they say, look, you're not here every day. You don't cover the White House every single day. Time Magazine covered it every day forever. 
it doesn't anymore because there's no money for that kind of thing. And does the Post send photographer over? Uh, rarely. No, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So. Explain for the audience who may not be aware of this, how a pool uh, operates around the president. Well, what happens is, but you know something, Neil? I'm not sure that I could describe a pool today because I'm not absolutely sure who is in the pool today. Yeah. When I was there, when Dirk and I were there, um, there was, if it was a pool situation, which they did on, on occasion when they wanted a smaller group, a more manageable group to see something. And uh, like on Air Force One, you can't have the whole everybody. So you have a pool on Air Force One and it's one magazine photographer and it is uh, wire two service. wire services or it depends on how many wire services right. are functioning. But, uh, one daily newspaper, one television crew and producer. It's that's and an agency, and that's the kind of and they pool. make what they sh available to everybody else. Exactly. If I were the pool on Air Force One, and the president came back and spoke to us, that film that I shot on the plane that day would go to New York to Time, but it would be shared. They would send it, to, they'd to make a quick edit to, to your competitors, and that's what a pool mm -hmm. is, and a lot of things had to be done by pool. But today, I can't tell you who's in the pool. Lucian, do you have any idea? Well, it, I think what's happened is that the White House has said, forget the pool, we'll just have our photographer do it, and uh, if you want it, you can have it, if not, you, that's tough luck. Right. So what they've done is bypassed the pool that Diane is talking about. Um, I mean, they still do have pools, uh, but they're trying to cut it out more and more. So. Oh, LBJ's turning over in his grave. You remember, <laughs> you remember the, all the pictures? That, remember the picture of LBJ raising up, showing the scar? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> remember the picture of LBJ reaching down and grabbing the beagles by the ears to hear them howl? And how that, those pictures just went everywhere because the press was there yes, taking these but pictures. Also, LBJ had a fabulous um, personal photographer in Yoshi Okamoto. Yeah. And his pictures, which are here yeah, at the library, the library yeah. are unbelievably beautiful and wonderful and interesting. And uh, it's a great yeah. collection that you have here. Well, we deviated. And I apologize <laughs> yeah. for getting off script here for a moment. But I think it's interesting to get your observations on what's happening now. And it was at a point where we were going to move to the pictures uh, that I selected. Ah. Uh, that uh, uh, each of you took that uh, for, uh, struck me, and I wanted to get the information on them. And this first one uh, that we've selected, Diana, was a picture you took. Yes. Uh, I really like this mm -hmm. uh, picture because it, uh, tell us what it shows and what's happening here. Um, I am proud of that picture. It was it won World Press that year, and it was. President Bush had gone on Thanksgiving in 1991, I guess, to Kuwait, and he went to see all the services um, in, um, on Thanksgiving, particularly the soldiers who were waiting, uh, unbeknownst to us, for um, Desert Storm. And uh, his uh, entanglement with Iraq. And we got out into the desert by helicopter, and all these soldiers, um, he shook hands and had lunch with them, and I hadn't really taken a picture yet. You know, there are times when you think, gosh, I just I haven't got it. And he all of a sudden got up on a, on a box, and he started throwing souvenirs to the soldiers. He had tie clips and key rings, and that cuff kind of links. thing, cufflinks, okay. and he was throwing them out to the soldiers. I mean, he looks sort of like M Moses parting the waters, but <laughs> I, don't, I don't want you to be misled, and I always hope that the caption is on this picture telling you what he actually was doing. Yeah. But soon after, the sun was gone, and we were packed back in the helicopter, and we were going. So this was taken when the light was almost gone, oh. and it's one of those pictures you just hold tight and hope you're hope you've got everything right. The light, the f-stop, the shutter speed, the film, the everything, because it was beautiful. It was just a beautiful moment. I'm going to skip past this next picture and come back to it that you took, <laughs> Diana, but I want to go quickly to this one. 
Mm. Lucian took this picture. Lucian, this pic uh, when I was going through the exhibit here several days, that, that picture grabbed me uh, uh, in, in just so many different ways. Describe what's happening here to the... Uh, uh, this is uh, quite right after the war, and it was... Um, I, there's, there's so many stories to, to tell about Kuwait, but I'll stick with this. This is uh, the oil fires that were set by the uh, retreating Iraqi troops. And the, the fires were so intense uh, that even in Kuwait City, it looked like nighttime during the daytime. Uh, the whole, All the smoke the whole, was blanketing the area. The whole there were area. 600 uh, oil gas was on fires, yeah. something like that? Uh, but but as, it, as far as you could drive, it was almost like you're driving at nighttime. And so I was out in the oil fields, and I just came across this donkey uh, that uh, grabbed some bedding. It was uh, bedding from a trench, an Iraqi uh, trench that they had dug, and he playfully throwing it up in the air. And so I'm photographing this and mesmerized by the donkey in the, in the whole scene. Uh, and as it started getting dark, dark, as it became darker, I turned around and I'm walking back to my car and I feel something behind me and I turn around and this donkey's following me. <laughs> and, and at this moment, I have this tremendous amount of guilt because there's no way this donkey's going to survive in this, mm -hmm. in this situation. Oh. And, uh, and I just really felt bad for the donkey. And as I'm driving back to Kuwait City, I'm thinking about this donkey alone in this field. Um, two years later, um, this photograph was in an exhibition in Boston. And I get a telephone call from, I think his name was Mark Walsh, who worked for the, the World uh, Wildlife Fund. And he goes, Lucian, uh, I just want to let you know, I was in Kuwait when this was going on. We were saving the uh, zoo animals in Kuwait City. And he goes, but I, I drove out to the oil fields, and I saw that donkey. And I put it on the back of my pickup truck, and I took it to a family and gave, I took it to Kuwait City and gave it to a family. Oh. Amazing. <laughs> All right, that's good, that's good. So special. Uh, we're, we're nearing the last few photographs. Again, I'm going to come back to the one I mentioned a minute ago, Diana. But Lucian, let's stay with you because I selected this photograph that you took because it's, it's a picture of war, but mm. not war. Look, look at the faces here and tell us what this is all about. Uh, this is the war in Kosovo. Um, when I arrived, I, I arrived to Macedonia, which is uh, right next to Kosovo. Uh, Kosovo is in, in former Yugoslavia. Um, and when I got there, there were 50,000 refugees uh, in a no man's land between Kosovo and, Alba um, and Macedonia. And they were pushed out by the Serbs, and the Macedonians were not allowing them in. And, and these refugees had been there for five days uh, without any protection from the elements, uh, or food, or water, or anything. Um, the UN UNHCR came in. They started uh, uh, putting the refugees on buses. And uh, they had quickly built uh, these refugee camps further into Macedonia. So these are refugees. And it's funny, I talked to a lot of these refugees. These were you know, teachers, doctors, lawyers, people like us living they lived in Pristina. They're sitting in their homes having dinner one night, and all of a sudden, soldiers come to their door and force them out, and, they're, and they find themselves yeah. out of their homes. And what you're seeing here is they're arriving at the refugee camp. And this is something I saw over and over again. It's, it's the shock of reality of what happened to my life. All of a sudden, I'm looking at tents that I'm now living in. And, uh, and it was just an overnight situation. Yeah. It was, it was as, as if any of us are sitting at home one night and somebody banged on our, our door, broke it down, pushed us out in the street, and marched us for 20 miles. And next thing we know, we're, we're looking at our future. And that's what we're, we're seeing right here. And look at the expression on the youngster to the left and then the uh, older person there. 
tells a lot. It tells a lot. Well, we're going to go back now to the picture that I skipped past, and uh, because it's got a great backstory as well. <laughs> Diana took this picture, and Does it look uh, familiar to anybody out there? Have you seen it before? <laughs> yeah. Let, let me set a little bit of a scene because I want Diana to tell you really how this story, as uh, Don referred to it, I think, in the introduction, how it, how it went viral. But first, I want you to, this is the Secretary of State of the United States of America flying first class <laughs> in the State Department aircraft. Uh, you know, a lot of times we think everything looks like Air Force One these days, but uh, this is how uh, they travel when she's on a mission uh, around the world to various locations. So, Diana, you were here as part of a pool, or were you assigned for this? Yes. Um, yeah, I was uh, sort of taken off the shelf and dusted off and sent out two years ago um, to do a story on, on the Secretary of State, because I'd photographed her so much when, uh, in her Senate years and her years as First Lady. Um, this actually is not the way she always flies around. This is um, a C-17 transport plane. And she was going um, unbeknownst to the rest of the world. She was flying from, um, um, what's that island? Well, it doesn't matter. We were going across to Tripoli. Mm. And um, they, of course, didn't want people to know where she was going because Gaddafi was still alive and everything was quite dicey there. Um, and so it's, a, it's uh, from, from Malta, it's a very quick trip just oh. across the water. Um, what happened to this picture, I was in, there were only two photographers um, on this trip, a Reuters photographer and myself, and there was no room for anybody else because it was um, uh, a very important trip for her. She was going not only to, to um, Tripoli, but to Afghanistan, Pakistan. Uh, was this announced ahead of time, or was it? No, not okay. until she was on the ground. Okay. And um, so we were asked to if we'd like to take a picture before the plane took off. And so Kevin of Reuters and I said, oh, of course. And we went up front, and there she was. And she was leaning in her bag and brought up her dark glasses and put them on. I guess they were the only prescription glasses she could put her hands on, and she had her Blackberry. So we took this picture, and um, I thought, oh, she's probably not going to like this with the dark glasses. And it doesn't matter. It's a nice picture. And um, I went back to my seat. And when I got back to the United States, there was talk in New York about this picture. They loved it, and they wanted to run it big, or they actually thought about it for the cover. And um, they, I, I, I thought, oh, I don't know about this. Um, but it was the double truck in the magazine. End of story. Uh, everybody was happy with it, and you know, the story was over. And the, and the secretary was happy with the photograph. Apparently. Okay. And then. Um, it's too long to describe, but maybe four or five months later, um, a web uh, site called Tumblr uh, found this picture and took it and turned it into what they call a meme. Does everybody know what a meme is? I didn't until this happened. But it's when you take a picture, when you use a picture and you add captions to it and other pictures, and you make stories up, and it goes around, and, and the, that's what happened to this picture. And so, uh, well, what kind of captions? Oh, well, there was one where um, Obama is on his Blackberry, and he says, um, hey, Hill, what are you doing today? And she <laughs> says, uh, ruling the world. <laughs> and, and so, I was not happy when I heard about this, that it had been turned into a meme. I wasn't happy at all. Um, it was stolen. It was not attributed. Oh, you made a lot of money off of it? <laughs> no. It wasn't attributed to me, had no credit on it, and it was also getting a little bit dicey. And the Secretary of State, on the other hand, her staff thought it was great and they invited the Tumblr guys down uh, to meet her, and she was wonderful with them, and she says, oh, it's very funny. And they say, well, will you uh, text us for a picture? 
And she said, sure, but wait a minute. I've got to get my dark glasses and my Blackberry. <laughs> <laughs> and so they were absolutely charmed by her. And she handled it so well that they put themselves up on the, on the website and called it a day and said, it's over now. We can't do better than having the secretary text us. So that was her way of dealing with it. And I said, Diana, get a life. <laughs> relax about this and enjoy it. Uh, Time magazine finally got them to put my credit on it. And um, the picture went viral, uh, as they say, and um, went all over the world. And it's still out there somewhere. Still out there getting... Uh, it was not exactly what I thought was going to be the result <laughs> of this trip with the Secretary of State. Thank you very much. Diana Walker, uh, Lucian Perkins, we appreciate so much your views and your work. Thank you. Thank you. Now, part two of the fun work. We're now going to adjourn, and you can go into the library and walk through and see these photographs and many more. Uh, David's and Dirk's photographs up there too as well and the, their works as well as many others that they've referred to and, uh, and get a feeling for what this exhibit is all about and what the Briscoe Center has compiled and is still continuing to compile and probably will for many, many years into the future. Uh, a fantastic history of this country seen through the eyes of amazing photojournalists. There will be a reception up there in the Great Hall uh, as you go up, and uh, as uh, Mark said a bit earlier, the, uh, the LBJ Library store will be open as well if you want to drop by and, and uh, take home a souvenir uh, of the evening in some way. We thank you so much for being here this evening. <laughs>